Hello everyone, my name is Pixelriffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we're going to head over the hill to a project that I've already started on a live stream. I started thinking I need a permanent tree chopping area because I'm tired of turning the front yard of basically my home, like the area where my starter house and my storage room and everything else is, into a big old splodge of podzol whenever I grow spruce trees. And I grow spruce trees quite a lot because as you progress through the game, you'll find that you basically always need wood. You need it as a building material, you need it as a crafting resource to make other things, you'll need to make handles for tools and chests so that you can make hoppers and chests so that you can have the hoppers output into something, and I decided that it was time to set up a more permanent tree farming area. I like to chop trees manually, I know a lot of people might be expecting me to make an automatic tree farm, but the fact is, it's one of those meditative tasks in Minecraft that I prefer to stay manual for a reasonable amount of time. Yes, we may end up making automatic farms for some of these in future, especially if we need a lot of it, like if I want you know, a few double chests worth of oak logs, it's going to potentially be a better use of my time to set up an automatic farm compared to farming it all manually when I need it. But occasionally I like to do a little bit of topping up on the amount of wood that I have, and so I decided to lay out these little plots where I can grow different types of trees and come here to harvest the wood whenever we need it. Now, I have this plot laid out as an example, and because my preferred way of farming oak logs is with azalea saplings, which you can plant in each of these individual spots where I have the rooted dirt laid out here, but they won't actually grow unless you bone meal them in the case of azalea. If we want to, we could put some oak saplings in these spots and they would eventually just grow on their own without needing to spend bone meal on it, but I like azaleas for the leaves and honestly they're a slightly more manageable task to chop down than some of the taller oak trees. So I decided to leave this plot open for now as an example and so that you can see how the plots look when they are full. In Java Edition you can grow saplings side by side, you can leave no air gap in between the trees and they will still eventually grow and maybe you can bone meal a few of them if they don't, but in this case I've decided to space them out one block apart because if there is not a block directly to the side of them in the form of a sapling or something else, it will be slightly easier for the tree to grow. They won't find any obstructions nearby that will prevent them from growing. And the moss carpet here might count as an obstruction, but in the case of the birch trees and in the case of the azalea trees over here, they don't seem to be particularly inhibited by the fact that there is moss carpet around. The only reason trees might see this as an obstruction is if their leaves grow fairly close to the ground. So if they're trying to generate leaves here, then the moss carpet would get in the way of that, and then the game would decide not to grow that particular tree. But in this case, we can spread apart these three tree types and have no problems with them growing in a formation like this. However, that changes when we move on to the tree types, which it is better, or in the case of Dark Oak, required to grow them in a 2x2 formation. So the row behind is all set up to grow these trees. We've got giant spruce over here, since those will grow in a 2x2 formation which produces a lot more wood than growing the saplings individually. In fact, I think a couple of the individual saplings grew back here. There's a couple of trees side by side on that bit of podzol that didn't have all four saplings there. But in this case, the podzol is going to spread to take over any grass, any rooted dirt, or anything like that that you leave around here. I think moss is also taken over by podzol as well. So I decided to switch from the rooted dirt to the blocks of podzol here for my planting area, and that's worked out pretty well. I couldn't put moss carpet around these though, because we discovered on stream that the 2x2 two two of spruce saplings is even more picky about what is grown around it. They will happily grow naturally on their own, even when they have other saplings next door to them, but if you put moss carpet around the base of where you expect the tree to grow, even spamming it with bone meal does not grow the tree. The main reason for changing up those blocks in particular, the moss carpet here and the grass paths around this, is twofold. One, to set out a plot area in which the trees can be grown every single time so you don't end up placing the saplings in odd places, and two, so that if you are using some bone meal, let's say I grab some bone meal out of this chest here, I can't spam right click the bone meal on anything other than the spot where the tree is growing. When we were setting these up originally, I found that occasionally I would right click on some grass 
outside of the area where I was growing the saplings, and you just get a bunch of grass and flowers and stuff growing, potentially waste a bit of bone meal doing that. I want any bone meal I use to only be used on the tree saplings themselves. And as you can see from that demonstration, using bone meal on moss carpet or using it on dirt path around here really doesn't do anything, which is ideal. I have some frog lights around the outside here on the moss carpet once they are underneath the moss carpet here on these little corner ornamentations that I decided to put together with some planks and slabs. And that's really just to make sure that even if night falls, the trees still have a chance at growing because trees do require some light either from the sky or from block light in order to grow naturally. And while the spruce trees and the dark oak trees over here will happily grow in this formation, the jungle trees, as you can see, have not. And I planted these second to last when I was developing this area, but I planted the dark oak trees last and they have not really done the same thing the jungle trees have here. The jungle trees have been very resistant to growing in such close quarters. And honestly, it's not because of the size of the trees or the leaf patterns or anything, it's because of the vines. When these saplings check whether or not they can grow, they count the vines as something that obstructs them from growing. In some cases, they may be able to grow completely outside of the area in which this tree grows, but probably the reason that this tree has grown so small is that there were vines dangling down above that height from this tree here that grew first. We'll probably end up taking down the leaves manually with a fortune hoe since jungle saplings have a reduced drop rate compared to the saplings from other trees. And then that should leave the remaining saplings that are already planted here with enough room to grow in the meantime. But this is as far as I have got with this planting area. We obviously need to include areas for cherry wood and mangrove woods. Those are the two that we're missing from the overworld trees. We also want to create a planting area for warped and crimson fungus so that we can get warped and crimson stem and the warped and crimson planks out of those. And then we might set up a bamboo field as well, potentially with a slime block flying machine to harvest it because the bamboo farm I already have over here at my plants farming area has produced a reasonable amount of bamboo in its lifetime and does have that bone meal functionality around the back so that we can activate a bunch of dispensers dispensing bone meal to grow the bamboo automatically if we want to. But I would much rather have a large scale bamboo collection because that means we can turn a ton of it into blocks of bamboo and then from there you get fewer bamboo planks from the blocks of bamboo than you do with regular wood also it's balanced for the amount of fuel this generates in a furnace so perhaps we won't do that today but in the long term i think we do want to have an area over here with a larger bamboo field planted so that we can get some automatic harvesting on a much larger scale now with that said i want to do a couple of different things here first of all i'm going to continue expanding this so that we have room to grow mangrove which kind of requires a different planting setup than most other trees if you want to farm it. We'll set up a plot similar to these ones for cherry trees. I think those grow in a different formation, so we'll maybe need to get a little bit more room for those. Although, honestly, they don't really grow in wilder shapes than something like an acacia tree does, so we shouldn't need to worry too much about that. We'll set up the nylium areas that are specifically for planting the warped and crimson fungus, and we'll make sure that we have a means to regrow the nylium if any of it gets destroyed by the trees growing. Then I want to make sure that there are water channels flowing throughout this entire area. And I think we'll probably dig a channel through somewhere like this in between the two planting areas here. We'll have some water streams flowing downhill. And each time we reach an intersection like this, it can branch in a couple of different directions. Because that way, once we've started chopping down all of these logs, once we have finished cutting down the trees and my inventory is full of logs and probably sticks and saplings and stuff as well. I can leave the saplings here for replanting, but we can just throw the logs into a water stream and have them carried away to a sorting system. When I was setting up this area, one of the things I was concerned about was having to take the logs all the way over to my storage system every time I cut down a fresh set of logs or having to store them somewhere temporarily and make multiple trips. Instead, what I think I'm going to do is have a sorting system collect all of these logs and sort them into shelker boxes, which we can just break and take over to the storage system and have a bunch of those in my inventory, potentially one for every wood type here, without worrying about it being a ton of inventory space and having to make multiple trips. I think that makes a lot more sense. So today, we're going to work a bit more on this tree farm, and then I'm going to introduce you to the concept of a shelker box loader. 
Hey folks, welcome back. So as you can see, I've now done a little bit more work on the tree farm, expanding it for the four remaining types of logs we're going to be chopping, including a larger section over here for mangrove, and we've got these terracotta waterways going throughout the entire thing, transporting anything that we throw in here down to the front of the farm, where I haven't quite finished connecting everything up because I still need to do a little bit of design work to figure out where the drops are going to be collected. But that's where our shelker box loader design is going to come in. And right now I've got these temporary waterways blocked out with dirt blocks. I was thinking of switching to copper for a kind of copper pipe transportation system. Blends reasonably well with the terracotta here and we can have this go into a sorting system, which first of all is going to extract all of the logs from each other so that they'll all get sorted into individual shulker boxes. And then we can just take those shulker boxes back to our sorting system. But in the instance that we are here for a while gathering specific types of trees, I think this is much more common with the 2x2 trees since they provide so much wood that you're likely to fill up more than a full shulker box of one of those. We want to make sure that we have a bunch of shulker boxes in reserve and they can cycle out once one becomes full. It'll put another empty one in there and that's what the shulker box loader is for. Before we do that though, I want to return to some of the stuff that we were looking at earlier and talk about the conditions under which each of these trees need to grow and why I've set up the platforms the way I have. We're used to cherry trees being roughly the same as the other wood types here, but I've decided to go back to the planting system I had at the front of the farm with individual saplings growing on individual spaces like this. And it looks like a couple of these saplings here aren't all that interested in growing when there's a full canopy of cherry trees above them. But once again, we're using a different block around the outside of the planting spaces just to make sure that I don't waste bone meal. And this time I chose mycelium because it actually works quite well with the cherry leaves themselves. You can almost imagine this being a cherry version of something like Podzol. And you don't get anything from bone mealing the mycelium itself. You don't grow mushrooms or anything like that, so that's nice and straightforward, really. Moving over to the next platform, and I do need to set up some lighting for the remainder of these, some more permanent things like frog lights instead of these torches. But the next platforms we have warped and crimson fungus growing here, and of course, the warped and crimson fungus is a very different case from growing something like a normal tree sampling, not least because we actually want to bone meal the environment around here in order to get more of these. You bone meal the small fungus, it's going to grow into a giant fungus, and then you harvest everything from there. But the things that you harvest are different to normal trees as well, because we will actually want to harvest the netherwort blocks and recycle them into more bone meal. And that's why I've set up a set of composters in here as an allay drop-off point. Similar to what we've done with mangrove leaves in the past, we're going to grow these using bone meal, we're going to harvest all of the warped water nether warp blocks, and any that we don't save, we can simply give to an allay, leave them to be collected on the ground, the allay is going to pick them all up and transport them over to the composting station there with a couple of note blocks, hopefully so that the drops will be distributed between two different hoppers there and two composters can be working double time to make sure everything gets turned into bone meal. In the meantime, we will actually need that bone meal for the continuation of this farm. Not only because we need to grow the fungus itself with bone meal, it won't grow naturally on its own like tree saplings do, but also when we break this, there's a chance that the nylium underneath will have reverted back into netherrack. It isn't guaranteed to happen that way, but when we grow one of these warped fungus, there is a chance that the netherrack underneath can convert back into netherrack from nylium instantaneously. A lot of the time I will try and avoid that happening over time by breaking the bottom block of the tree, but as you can see there, the damage has already been done. So what we need to do is make sure we have some bone meal on hand, right click on that netherrack and convert it back into nylium from the nylium around it. Then from the top of the plant we break all of the warped warp blocks and shroom lights, we gather any of those that we want to keep and the rest we either give to the allays or we can deposit them in the composters ourselves. And along with the warped foliage and the crimson foliage that are generated by both of these patches, that should keep us in enough bone meal that this farm can be run sustainably. We won't need to worry about getting more bone meal from elsewhere. In future we're also going to set up a fun automatic farm that you can use to get hold of larger amounts of warped and crimson fungus and foliage so that we don't have to worry about gathering all of those manually and working with them on these platforms. We'll set those up around here. If we have time, we'll do it in this video, but if not, we can save it for another video. The last thing to note about each of these platforms is that they have a slab here at the back, and that is really so that if we end up planting over this entire space and we lose all of the warped or crimson nylium, which seems unlikely given how I farm wood, but it would happen, we have one piece 
piece of nylium down here as a backup, a kind of fail safe, if you like. So if I break one of these down into netherrack here, even without any of the other nylium directly around it, we can right click on that with the bone meal. The one next to the slab is the one that we can restart the nylium growing from. And that piece of nylium down there if it's got a slab above it, you don't need to worry about it reverting back into netherrack at any point. So that's basically our fail safe, just in case I do something stupid like cover this entire thing up and have every block in here revert back into netherrack. And the same is true of the crimson farm over here. You can see that there's a piece of crimson nylium down there under the slab as well. Finally, I'm going to switch back to my silk touch hoe here to go and take a look at the mangrove, which is already growing down towards these water streams, but I'm fairly certain the roots should not grow into the flowing water and obstruct the flow here. My preferred way of farming mangrove is to grow as large a chunk of it as possible, and as many trees as we want to grow in this sort of relatively dense area, and then we're going to harvest all of the leaves. Once again, filling our inventory with some other blocks so that the leaves don't enter here. We want to basically just keep the mangrove logs in here, and then any leaves that are left over here in the canopy or drop down to the ground can be collected by a lays and thrown into the composter. And the reason for that, of course, is that mangrove leaves don't actually drop saplings in the way that regular trees do. In fact, the mangrove leaves will grow propagules from below them, which naturally reach a certain point where, regardless of what happens to the leaf blocks, they will fall and drop. So naturally we'll find a bunch of these on the ground after we're done harvesting the leaves from the top down. Alternatively, if you want to, you can simply set up a mangrove leaf anywhere in your world and right click on it with bone meal to start growing the propagule. And then that will naturally grow on its own or you can bone meal it a couple of times again to grow it to full maturity, at which point you can harvest it and use it as a sapling to plant another mangrove tree. The mangrove roots and moss carpets can also be harvested and composted. So you're really not going to find any waste in any of these mangrove trees. You can use every part of them as compost if you want to while still harvesting the logs. As for the surface around here, once again, mud you will find does not grow anything if you bone meal it accidentally, meaning that you won't end up growing a bunch of grass in the way that I often do when I'm growing mangrove trees on a grassy surface, because mangrove trees, while they grow from propagules planted on the ground, actually start their log formations a few blocks up, suspended on this little network of roots. And that means that a lot of the time you'll end up holding down right click to spam a tree with bone meal. And then when the tree grows, you still end up spamming the grass underneath it. And that means more cleanup. So I planted these on mud for a couple of reasons. The first being the bone meal thing. And the other reason being occasionally we'll get the opportunity to harvest some muddy mangrove roots from this process. The roots of the mangrove trees as they grow will naturally convert the mud blocks around them into muddy mangrove roots, which we can harvest in the same way that we do the mud, just with a shovel. And the great thing about that is you can still plant mangrove propagules on them, so you don't need to worry about this no longer being a growing surface for the trees. And if you don't want to worry about the muddy mangrove roots at all, you can simply replace this entire thing with podzol, which you can plant the mangrove propagules on without worrying about bone milling them for additional grass and wasting your bone meal. So at this point, we can go basically anywhere in our tree farm and separating the platforms, our water streams are where we're going to throw in the logs once we're finished carving them. The logs will float down the water streams. We can follow them as we go here and eventually they'll end up right at the end of this copper output where I don't have anything set up to collect them yet, but that's what we're going to work on next. Now to keep this compact, I think I'm actually going to double the water stream back on itself a little earlier. We're going to have it go there and that way it can keep it sort of tight to the front of the farm here. We'll make sure that this water stream gets connected to this one as well. We just need to bring that down a couple of blocks. And remember that water will flow for exactly eight blocks. So as the water streams cascade down the hill here, every time we drop a block in elevation, I can start a fresh water stream and those will carry all of the items along. But here at the end of the water stream, we actually want the water to keep going on the same elevation. And that way the items can be recycled around a system that's going to collect all of them and make sure that they get sorted into the right categories. For that, we need to go and grab some ice because that's that will make sure that the items from the water stream continue their momentum into the next water stream over. We're going to use packed ice for this simply because it's less expensive to do so and because regular ice potentially could melt under the right lighting conditions. So we're going to use packed ice. It's a decently slippery block, so it's not going to hold the items up or risk any of them stopping and despawning. We'll just need something like signs to hold back the water streams, cut them off where we need to, and continue another water stream that flows in one direction. So with the packed ice in place next to this water stream, we can add in a sign right there. So that's going to prevent the water from flowing any further and prevent another water source placed here from flowing back upstream. 
In the meantime, we are going to run the items over a series of hoppers, and here's where an important trick with honey blocks comes into play. This doesn't have to be honey blocks, but they're a very convenient source of this particular trick. Once we place an item in the water stream, we'll use a block of copper as an example, and we can follow that item's progress. That's going to get aligned along one side of this set of blocks here, instead of passing it directly over the top of the hoppers, because each hopper actually has a kind of hitbox where there's a dip in the center and we can actually stand in that dip if we're careful like so but that means items can also get caught in there as they flow over the top of each of these hoppers so having the flow of water across the top of here is going to potentially result in some items getting stuck and never reaching the filters they were intended for. This is why I haven't used water streams in other sorting systems so far and have resorted to having a line of hoppers. But in this case, we're going to use water streams instead because of the sheer amount of items that are going to be flowing down here. It would be too much for one hopper to store. And so even if the items continued flowing through, you would end up with a system where the hopper would back up with some of the different wood types. If my inventory has a bunch of stacks of spruce but then it also has some jungle some birch some acacia stuff that's going to stack in different places then that's a lot for a five slot hopper to handle so instead we're going to set up a row of item filters down here making sure that the contents of each of these hoppers is only going to let through a certain type of wood and we're going to run the honey blocks along the top of these hoppers to make sure that the items stay aligned with the edge of the hopper and do not fall into the central hitbox there and the reason this works with honey blocks is the same reason that the player sinks into the top surface of the honey block slightly. They actually have that one pixel border in the texture, which makes them slightly squishy on one side and thus allows an item entity to sit on the divide between these two blocks. Of course, if we set up all of these item filters side by side, they're going to have to have 41 of those logs in the top slot of the filter, otherwise the system is going to break the circuits to either side of it. So there are a couple of different solutions that we can use here to resolve the problem of where the items go if they can't go directly into the hoppers right away. The first thing I'm certain of is that we are going to have a circuit going around the outside here and returning the items to the start of the circuit so that they can be passed over those hoppers again. Because if I'm chucking four or five stacks of spruce logs from my spruce wood farm up there, I'm definitely not going to be able to fit all of that into this first hopper. Unless we set up a dropper clock somewhere around here that's going to spit out the items one at a time, but that creates the problem that we were trying to avoid in that that dropper has to be fed by a hopper and that hopper is going to back up with all of the different items. So we are going to have to make do with the items going around a circuit and each time they return to this hopper it should have emptied out a few more items that should allow a few more logs to go in there. The other thing we're going to do is probably split up these filter circuits so that instead of having 41 of each log in the hopper and four filler items we can fill it up with a few more filler items prevent it from breaking the circuits to either side. So each of these hoppers can start with only one item in the first slot, which makes sure that it does just filter that wood type, but will also allow more logs into the system every time it opens up a bit more space. So instead of a maximum of 23 logs we could put in there, we'll be able to basically take on a full stack each time. Spreading these item filters apart by a block or two will also allow us room to fit an individual shulker box loader for each of these without too much fuss. Because while I'm certain there are some one wide tileable shulker box loader designs out there, I have been unable to intuit one of those myself in a redstone testing world so i'm just going to go based on what i know for now and allow you folks to do a bit more of your own research if you want to discover what other designs are out there so what that means is these filters are actually going to be spaced a couple of blocks apart and we're going to have individual shulker box loaders attached to each one but once the shulker boxes are loaded we can have them broken and deposited in a chest where we can collect all of them from one place if we want to because the magical thing about shulkers is that instead of being pushed or pulled by pistons, they can be broken by pistons. If I do a quick example here, I should have some buttons around. If not, I can probably make one, but yep, there we go. We got one in this chest. If I activate this piston now, it's actually going to break the shulker box and the box will drop along with any contents it had. Let me throw these hoppers in here as an example. I'll push the button, the box will drop, and the box has those 10 hoppers in it. So in any kind of circuit in which we have some hoppers feeding items into a shulker box, we can detect whether or not the box is full using a comparator. Once that comparator outputs a full signal strength of 15 to indicate that there are no more free spaces 
inside of this shulker box. Then a signal can be sent to a piston to break it. And we can also send a signal to a dispenser, which will place a new box for us immediately after the piston fires. The broken shulker box can land in a hopper and the hopper can transport it to wherever it needs to go. And you might be wondering how we're going to put a shulker box above a hopper so that it can break and fall into the hopper without any of the contents being pulled out into the hopper below it. And the solution to that is very simple. We're going to put a slab over the top of the hopper and we are going to have the shulker box dispensed into the space above that slab. So there's still a half block gap, in fact a full block gap technically between the shulker box and the hopper itself. So any contents that go in there are going to stay in there. But when the box is broken using a piston and we're going to break it from above so that hopefully the momentum that the box has will carry it down into this space below, there we go, the piston pushing it will break it, it'll disappear under this slab, and when we check the hopper below we will find the shulker box with its contents waiting for us, and that could be piped to a storage chest where we can collect it along with a bunch of other boxes. I'm going to go to work setting up the remainder of these item filters, and the hopper outputs from these are going to be delivered directly into these shulker box loader mechanisms, and once that part of the circuit is all built up, I'll show you how to build the mechanism for the shulker box loader so you can try it yourself. Alright, I've tidied things up a bit. Immediately you're going to notice one major change, and that's that the honey blocks are in a different place. I actually decided to invert the way that the honey blocks were sitting so that the item filters could be stashed away underneath the tree farm. And that will leave us a little bit more space here that's open and easier to see what we're working on here as we construct these shulker box loaders. It's also going to allow us to centralize the line that's going to feed the shulker boxes back to a more central collection point because I'm fairly certain I want these to pop out just in a chest or a barrel or something like that on the surface instead of us having to go down here and collect them from individual chests. It's kind of for the sake of convenience. And I'm going to grab a few of the shulker boxes that I have in here, a few empties, so that we can demonstrate how straightforward this circuit is. The first thing I'm going to do is tidy that up a little bit. We're going to place a shulker box here. This is the shulker box that's going to be accepting the input from this first slice of filter here. Let's say this one's the oak wood. We're going to point the hopper into the side of the shulker box here. That's obviously going to feed the items in. And of course, the contents of this shulker box are going to need to be read by a comparator. So I'm using pre Prismarine for the item filters. I'm going to use the Prismarine here as well to support our redstone components because it's a really obvious block that isn't part of the terrain here. Now that comparator is going to be outputting into a block here which is going to have some redstone dust on it and some redstone dust is going to be on top of this Prismarine block here as well. Above each of these is where we're going to have our piston. Of course it does not need to be a sticky piston since its function there is to just break the shulker box. And next to the shulker box here we're going to have a dispenser. That's going to be ready to fire some additional shulker boxes out into this space once the first one gets broken. For the sake of this demonstration I'm actually going to reorient this shulker box so that it's facing towards us and the lid opens that way so that we can fill this with items and watch what happens when the circuit activates. But unfortunately dispensers when they dispense a shulker box will always dispense it facing this way kind of vertically so that the lid opens upwards and it won't be possible to open these up to determine what the contents are you'd have to break them or break some of the blocks around them in order to access that. But we're going to operate under the assumption that if we've set up the filter correctly, and we will do once we have a log in there, this box is going to fill up with contents and eventually be ejected without any other hiccups. We are going to place a building block above this dispenser so that that can be activated by some redstone wire, and then we're simply going to put the redstone dust up around here on top of the piston and turning to the right there so it goes over the top of the dispenser. Of course below this we need to set up a hopper one block lower than the shulker box down here and that way we can put a slab once again probably made of prismarine on top of a hopper which is going to collect the shulker boxes and once I've set up more of the system I'll come back and redirect a few of the hoppers so that they're facing into the same collection mechanism. The last thing we need to do is set up some kind of side input signal for this comparator so that the comparator only activates when the shulker box is full, which as you'll know from our previous experiments with comparators requires a full signal strength of 15 to be input into the side. That way when the comparator produces a signal strength of 15 because this shulker box is full, 
that's the only time it will activate and will light up all of this redstone dust in unison. So with a redstone block here in the floor, which is not activating any components nearby, it's not accidentally locking any of these hoppers or anything like that, we're simply going to place a piece of redstone dust on top of that, and that is our side input signal for the comparator. If I load this up with items now, you'll notice the comparator doesn't even switch on. And the cool thing about this is that we can mirror the circuit using this redstone block in the middle as our pivot point, basically. So we can have the same redstone signal here, lock another comparator on this side and we can build the same circuit up over here for the neighboring filter circuit. Now these two are spaced one block apart but since the circuit needs a little bit of room on this side I've left a little bit of space between this and the next two circuits so we're basically building these in sets of two. So we can set up exactly the same thing over here. We'll point the hopper in towards the center here because this is going to wrap around and we'll have the same set of circuits built on the opposite side of this little area down here. But we can do the same thing. We can set up a piston facing downwards there. We're going to have a shulker box coming out of this. And the same thing is going to happen on this side. Once this shulker box fills up with contents, it's going to be ejected. These two circuits should not interfere with each other because there are no places in which the redstone dust ever connects. So for the sake of demonstration here, I'm going to fill up a shulker box with spruce wood and let's assume that we got all of this from the tree farm. I'm going to remove about half a stack of the spruce wood here to simulate the idea that this shulker box is very close to being full and then back down here in our circuit we're going to pop out the existing shulker box there and replace it with this one full of spruce wood. Now presuming that we had some spruce logs inside of this hopper and all of the remaining spruce that we have harvested recently was filtering in I can pop the spruce logs in here that's slowly going to fill up inside of this shulker box and eventually, once that reaches maximum capacity, you'll see the circuit switches on, the piston should fire down from above, and it should replace that shulker box with a brand new empty shulker box. There we go. Now if we go down here into this hopper, you'll see that the shulker box full of spruce logs is there ready to be collected, or will be piped to an area where we can collect it a little later. Of course, you don't have to apply this solely to this tree farm. In fact, in many cases, you'll find areas where this applies even better than a tree farm. It's entirely likely that many of you will not want to fill up entire shulker boxes of some of these wood types, especially the ones that you're using less frequently. But I'm an over-preparer. I'm somebody who likes to harvest a bunch of wood in advance in his world to make sure that there's going to be a bunch of wood available to build with in future episodes. And so I think it's going to benefit me a great deal to have full shulker boxes of wood that I can take with me to other projects around the world, not just to put back into my storage system, but to bring with me on other adventures. So now you've seen how this setup works and now I've also built one in the first place so now I know how wide to make this and build the other half. I'm going to go ahead and set this entire thing up so we have 10 shulker box loaders ready to receive each of the different wood types. Okay, a short time and a couple of cups of tea later we have everything in here all set up redstone wise. The last thing I need to do is create a hopper line that's going to take the shulker box is out to this block here, where there's going to be a little bit more technical trickery involved in getting them back up to the surface without us ever having to come down here and collect them from the source. Because as you can see, all of the hoppers inside of here are going to be collecting the shulker boxes and they're a little bit tricky to get to right now. So at the end of this line of hoppers, instead of a dispenser, we are going to have a dropper. Remember the difference is that dispensers can use certain items and blocks in the case of shulker boxes, whereas droppers will always spit them out as an item. And this dropper is going to be facing upwards. I'm going to crawl under here just to make sure all of these hoppers are connected up and that nothing has gone missing. After which we should be able to cover over this line of hoppers to make sure that nothing else goes in there without us wanting it to. And I'm going to build a really quick dropper clock circuit just to measure whether or not this dropper has anything inside of it and make sure that it spits anything out if it does. These are pretty simple, you just need a comparator facing out of this dropper so that it's measuring the dropper's contents. We'll leave a block here but we'll dig out a block beyond that and we can place a piece of redstone dust there. Then we need to dig out these two blocks here because the redstone dust is going to power this block next to it. We'll take a repeater output from that to boost it to a signal strength of 15. We'll have that feeding into the side of the comparator so that the signal loops back and turns the comparator off again. And in normal circumstances, we could simply place another piece of redstone dust on top of this block to make sure that it was powered, and that would power the dropper, which would spit out any items that ended up inside of it until there were no items left. In fact, thinking about it, we should be able to do that in this case. I was thinking we were going to have a water column directly on top of the dropper, but we're actually going to have a block above that. So as long as this block here is blocked in, and so is this one, and we should probably 
put a few more blocks in here and make sure the area is lit up a little bit to prevent any unwanted mob spawns. But in other circumstances, we could replace this block here with a target block that would redirect the redstone into that and it would still end up doing the same thing. I'm going to grab my redstone box and close up this wall here and then we're going to go and get some soul sand. We'll place one block of soul sand on top of there and build up a pillar of ice and we're going to break that to turn it into water, making sure we do that with a fortune pickaxe and not a silk touch one and we create a bubble column there. Now whenever that dropper receives any items, it's going to spit them out into that bubble column. Unfortunately, things don't seem to have worked out that simple and it may be that the dropper having pushed the items up into the soul sand block finds that the easiest way to eject the items is actually over to one side. So maybe we do need to fill this in with a target block after all. Let's give that another try. If I can manage to get a couple of copper blocks in there, we should hopefully see those spat out by the dropper and there they go. <laughs> On top of the bubble column, they are propelled to the surface. Just going to do that with all 11 of these blocks individually to make sure that they all end up getting to the surface. We should be able to collect 11 blocks of copper from this in just a second. Once they reach the top of this bubble column, they should stack to together and we get 11 blocks back. Okay, perfect. That's one of the crucial things here because we want to make sure that we don't lose anything as valuable as a full shulker box of wood in the process of setting all of this up. But from there, all we're going to do is dig over a few more blocks so that this forms a water stream flowing in this direction, meaning that anything that ends up getting dropped in here and floating to the top will naturally be propelled this way. We can cover over that so that the entire thing just flows naturally instead of the items being flung into the sky. Then we simply dig out a block here to place a hopper into there. We make sure that the hopper ends up outputting into a barrel and then we can place an inverted stair block there so that the items will still flow into the hopper underneath that stair block but then the water doesn't end up reaching the barrel so it doesn't look quite as obvious. So now if we throw a few of these cut copper blocks in there let's see if they make their way into the barrel as expected. Yep there are our blocks right there perfect. So now anytime we've chopped down a full shulker box worth of trees those are going to be collected by the shulker box loaders in here. They're going to be loaded into this system. We can collect them from the barrel here without having to touch any of the redstone down there at all and it all arrives nice and neatly in a form that we can take elsewhere in the world. So now whenever I come down here every Tuesday when I have my wood chopping day I simply need to throw all of these logs into the water streams around here and the shulker boxes will do the rest. I think that's a pretty decent deal. But before I can really do that I do need to go and get some more shulker boxes for these things and I also probably need to come back through and wax some of this copper if I want it to stay this age because yes I have been working on this project for long enough that some of the copper around here has started to show signs of weathering. So I think that's probably the right time to say thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixorifs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.